It is good to see everyone today. Uh, and before we get into the message, I, I'm going to ask for about two minutes of your time. And we did something two weeks ago, did it again last week downtown. I want to do it again this morning. And it's what we, what we talked about in regard to loving our city. And when you love something, you fight for it. And the best way we can fight as Christians is by praying for our city. This area, once again, is a lot as far as what's gone on in Green Bay, some of the challenges. This downtown area has been kind of a hotbed for it. And then I don't know if you saw in the news uh, what happened out at the casino last night. Our city still needs to be fought for. There are still people who, God, there's one or two people who you may know and in the city who God needs to grab a hold of their hearts. And we're going to continue to fight and ask God for our city. Ask God to continue seeing lives changed for him. Ask God that our blinders are opened, are taken off, that we see the people around us, that we have the opportunity to bless, to minister to, to speak the love of Jesus to, because there's still people looking for it. Would you join me in prayer, please? Father, we lift up our city to you. And God, we thank you once again for Green Bay, Wisconsin. We thank you that we get to live right here in Brown County. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be on assignment for you in this region. Lord, I pray that we see it as more than just the place we go to work or the place we go home to. But God, may we see it as the place you've called us for your kingdom's work, for your army's work. I pray, Lord, that each of us will have our eyes open to the opportunities of ministry around us, to those we can talk to, to those we can pray with, to those maybe we invite the church. Lord God, to those that we can be the hands and feet of Jesus to. I pray, Lord, for those who are affected by the shooting last night. I pray, God, for uh, health to those who are in the hospital or who are... Um, in, in a dangerous place health-wise. I pray, Lord, uh, and I thank you for protection for those first responders who went in. Lord, I pray over the heart of our city. I pray over the violence that has, has risen up. And Jesus, we pray for your peace. We pray for your peace in our communities. We pray for your peace in our own hearts. God, that we don't let anything get a hold of us so strongly that we lose the grasp of the peace that the scripture says should guide and guard our hearts and our minds. Lord, may we be a people of peace. May we be a people, Lord God, even though we are on assignment, we move in in the strength and the boldness and the courage of the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. We, we go in with a peaceful confidence that we have been equipped to do just that. Lord, I pray that our eyes are set on the cross. And remember, we remember that you are why we are here, not for us ourselves. Lord, I thank you for this downtown campus, and I pray for the area around us. I pray uh, for those who share this building. And Lord, once again, may we be a light to this community and its dark places. May we bring hope where there is hopelessness. I thank you for every life-giving church in this community who meets this morning. And we pray that you'll bless them. And just as I would ask for right here, I thank you and ask that your presence is in their place as well, that they know it, that they see life change because of it. We ask the same for here at Spring Lake. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Just be aware, let's keep our eyes open for what God may be doing in the people's lives around you, around me for the conversations that can be had, maybe even the people that God, God may tell you, don't say a word to them, pray for them. That's the best thing we can do. So keep that on your radar. Now, we are in a new series. Adam launched it last week here entitled uh, Remarkable Women of the Bible. I want to do a little bit of an overlap before I jump into our person that we're going to talk about this morning. And I want to talk for just a second about why are we doing this series? Why this series? And one of the challenges, one of the responsibilities we have as a church and as a teaching team is to make sure what the Bible calls preaching the whole counsel or all of the wisdom of scriptures. And if you think about it, we spent six months in one 16-chapter book of the Bible. Six months 
of going line by line through each chapter, through the different verses of Scripture. Six months of then taking what we study line by line into our life groups to ask questions and to continue to chew on it and get the most out of it that we can. Six months of learning directly from what Mark's letter, what Mark's account had to say. We went from that six months into a two-week series on heaven. Now, if you were to say, where is the exact one verse you use? We use the whole Bible. What does the Bible have to say about heaven? It was a systematic study, a systematic look at what heaven is. Life after death, and then life after life after death. And I took away great peace, knowing that in real time, as real as us sitting in this room right now, my mom, my dad, who have both gone on to heaven, are enjoying the presence of God. It's it's like they might as well be in a room right next door. It's that real to them. It is that real as to what they're experiencing. So I took away a lot from that. And, And here's my challenge to you, because some people say, well, I only like to learn this way in studying scriptures. Well, I only like to learn from this type of teaching. That's not biblical. When you look at scripture, you're going to see books like Romans and Hebrews, But then you're going to see books like James, very different approaches, very different uh, content, but it's got the same purpose and the same meaning. And the meaning and the the purpose is to point us to Christ. You can look at the Gospels, which tell us about Jesus' life, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then you look at Leviticus, totally different approach, totally different reason for being in the Bible, but both serve God's purposes. So when we do different teaching styles, when we go uh, from a study of a book of the Bible to a systematic study of something in Scripture, we're going to do it from a biblical perspective. What does God have to say about this? And then we're going to do like this study that we're going to do for the next six weeks. And then the, the next study is going to be very similar, where we're going to do a character study. God put the people in the Bible for a reason. We can learn from them. And that's what this teaching is about. We can learn from those in Scripture. Now, the Scriptures are full of truly remarkable women that we don't get give enough attention to other than maybe on Mother's Day. But we don't get a full scope of the character and the influence that these remarkable women had. They're remarkable for all different reasons. You're going to see in this series, you're going to hear about women who are leaders, teachers, mothers, warriors, heroes, and villains. I'm like excited about this. It's like a movie caption. So I want us to, to realize what we're doing here is we're, we're pulling and learning from the scriptures in a, in a different way than we did with Mark, but it is a very biblical way, and I hope you can find truth in that. Now, here's the second thing I want you to see about why we're doing this series. There are groups through history who have kind of downplayed God's willingness to work through a woman who is obedient to him. And it's a shame. Ladies, I hope that through this series, I hope God speaks to you and maybe opens your eyes to the ministry opportunities that are in front of you. Younger ladies and and maybe young girls, I hope you see how God moved in women throughout scripture and be ready to be amazed at what God may do through you. Women, I want you to see that God called, equipped, appointed, anointed, set apart women, and he's still doing it today. Ladies, you in the room, embrace that. God has equipped you and called you and put you in seasons and circumstances in life and even within this church for specific reasons. And now, men, some of you are going to go, well, it's about women, I can't relate. Yes, you can. And you can learn from this. Uh, I thank God for the woman, women who speak into my life, past, present, and future, old and young, and I would be a fool not to listen. And I would challenge us in the same way. We need to be aware of what God is speaking through these ladies and through ladies in this life. I am grateful for some amazing teachers, leaders, counselors, musicians, administri- administratively gifted ladies that are within our church. And with saying that, last week, Adam launched us with Priscilla, a teacher. This week, I want to talk about Mary. 
Now, there's a lot of Marys in Scripture, but I'm going to focus about on Mary, the mother of Christ. First, let me start with some uh, facts, some background about Mary. Um, just to clarify some things, there are no miracles in Scripture accredited to Mary. I know there are some who say there is. You can't find it in Scripture. Second, she was not God. She was not a God. She was not a co-redeemer. She was not a deity. Scripture doesn't say this. Mary never said this. We don't see it anywhere. Mary did die. There were some teachings that Mary never died. Yes, she did. We know this. Mary never whispered words of wisdom. Let it be. For you Beatles fans, you'll know what that is. Uh, Mary's father in Luke chapter 3, his name was Heli, H-E-L-I. There's a very close relative to Mary we see in Scripture as well, Elizabeth, which means that John the Baptist was related to her as well. Mary was raised in a city called Nazareth. Now, Nazareth is very poor, very poor. The closest thing we could think of is maybe some harsh, poor inner city regions of our country. Mary was from a very, very poor, very destitute area. There's one place in Scripture where someone asks, can anything good come from Nazareth? I mean, it is not the place you're going to go vacation. Mary is basically a little ghetto girl who is betrothed, who's promised in marriage to a man named Joseph, probably in her, in her mid-teens. And that's a pretty normal age to be betrothed at that point. Now, what does betrothed mean? Not our typical language here in America. Betrothed is a Jewish custom. Was, it's basically step one of marriage. It's a declaration that was made to the prospective bride. Usually a small gift was given and, as, a, as a pledge in the presence of witnesses, uh, or else the declaration may have been in writing. But it's Joseph's way of saying, hey, we're as good as married. We're almost there. We have a ceremony to go, but I'm this serious. That's what betrothal was. Now, Joseph, Mary's husband, uh, there's a fourth century writing called The History of Joseph the Carpenter. It says that when they were betrothed, Mary was 12 and Joseph was 90 with grown kids, which I would say, yikes, uh, scripture never says that. The picture we get of Joseph from Scripture is that he was a carpenter, which was a lucrative and very hands-on, busy business. It never, there's never a list of other uh, marriages that Joseph had. Joseph may have been in his 30s. That would have been very common at, at an upper age. Maybe in his 20s, Mary would have been in her mid-teens. Um, one last side note with Joseph. We don't know when. But we do know Joseph dies when, when Jesus is still younger. The last time we see Joseph in Scripture, Jesus is 12 years old. We never see his name again. And we always see Mary with Jesus, which if the father dies, the oldest child has the responsibility for the mother. So whatever point Joseph died, Jesus, Mary is with Jesus the rest of the time. One last quick note. Mary does have other children. We read in Mark 6 and in Matthew 13, the names of her children, such as James, Joseph, Judas, not the same Judas who was a disciple, different Judas, and Simon. Those were the brothers. There's also scriptures that talk about his sisters. Mark 3, 31 and 32 tell us that Jesus' mother and his brothers and sisters were actually looking for him. So Mary is basically this normal girl who grows up with normal big dreams of what a girl would dream about. And all of a sudden, Luke 1.42 tells us that that entire dream is interrupted. An angel shows up and basically says, if you take all the women out there, Mary, you are chosen. You are um, above the rest because God has chosen you for an incredible assignment. You know, we talk about the disciples, we talk about the apostles, we dig into Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we talk about Peter, which we should. But nobody but Mary was with Jesus from birth to death. Nobody but Mary knew the intricacies of Jesus' life at every stage of his humanity. Nobody understood what the heart of a mother was in watching her son and watching Jesus. We'll talk about that in a minute. Except Mary. Mary had a front row seat for the world changing. And it was because of her son. 
Mary was with Jesus every year of his recorded life and beyond from the first miracle to the empty grave, the birth and the crucifixion, the pouring out of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. She's there for that. She attends the church in Galatia after Jesus' death, his burial and resurrection. So she sees the birth of the church, everything that Jesus had said he was going to do. She had a front row seat and saw it all. What do we take away from Mary. Here's the first thing you just cannot miss with when you look at Mary's life. It's her obedience. And I, I kind of slash this. Obedience and priority. Obedience and priority. Mary's life early on looked like a Cinderella story. Coming out of poverty, being betrothed to Joseph, someone who would have had a, like I said earlier, a lucrative business. And this was her way out. Not only for her, but for her parents, her family. And we talk about this pretty much every Christmas, but this angel shows up and tells her, you're going to have a holy child. You are going to give birth to a child and it's not going to be Joseph's. There is no easy way. There is no good way to break this news to Joseph. I can't imagine what's running through her mind at that point, but I'm thinking to myself as I'm I'm reading and going through this, how do you even start this conversation? Hey, Joseph, sit down. I got something something funny to tell you. You're not going to believe this. Joseph, I need you to be understanding. Or you can do it the way my wife does. I have something to tell you and you can't get mad. How do you start this conversation? How do you make it work? Mary has so much riding on that moment and for her future. And yet look at her response to the angel with everything on the line. I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. I don't care what else may happen. I'm the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. Now these next five words kind of make me upset. It says, then the angel left her. If you're going to give me news like that, can you hang around a while for a little bit of proof? Because this is like UFO type news. I'm pregnant with a child from God and have never been with a man. And there's an angel here to prove that I'm telling you the truth. That that would at least help break the ice a little bit. But it says, then the angel left. Mary has to go visit other family leave her small town for a while. But she stays on tasks. She risks everything. And her priority to obedience to God shine through. What an example for us. When God speaks in private, we have to keep the priority of obedience in public. I want to say that again. When God speaks to us in private, we have to keep the priority of obedience in public. Well, no one else will know. Well, there's no accountability. Yes, there is. If you know God has spoken to you, we have the responsibility to live it out. If we know what Scripture says, we have the responsibility to live it out. Mary gives birth to Christ. We know the story. Every Christmas we talk about it. Shepherds show up. Wise men show up. There's prophecies about them. And if I'm Mary, this is the point where I go, I told you so. I told you this child was going to be amazing. Not just like the mom and first baby amazing, but like God doing something here, amazing. But we never never see that with Mary. Think about if it was you and you had watched. Wouldn't there be kind of a, a little bit of a reprieve like, oh, thank you, God, that's true. I didn't lose my mind in this. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. And I want to let others know with a big, I told you so. We never see that from Mary. There's this incredible recorded response from Mary that's actually just the opposite. You see, and this is the next point, you can't look at Mary's life and not see humility. You can't look at Mary's life and everything she goes through from beginning to end and not see humility. There's never a call from Mary of, I was right. See it my way. Mary is just soaked in, clothed in humility. There's a passage in Luke 1, beginning at verse 46. It'll be on the screens. It's Mary's response, even before everything starts 
going the way that the angel had said it was, even before she's had the talk with Joseph. Look at, look at Mary's heart. It says, my soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and to his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Nothing is solved. Nothing is resolved. And yet Mary can stop and look back at history and see how good God has been. God blesses the humble. God walks with the humble. Let's fast forward a few years. John chapter 2 tells us about a wedding that Mary is attending with Jesus. Now, weddings back then weren't like weddings we have today. It wasn't a 30-minute ceremony and an hour with a DJ, two hours with a DJ for a reception. These weddings went on for days and sometimes a full week. An entire town many times would shut down. And this family who's hosting the wedding is responsible for food and drink for the whole community for a week. Your family name rested on how big and how well the wedding party went. No pressure. So Jesus and Mary are at this wedding, and it must have been a family wedding because Mary's got some inside information. She goes to Jesus and says, they've run out of wine. It's a good way to kill a party. They've run out of wine. John chapter 2, beginning at verse 1, it says, On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Mary seems to almost instigate Jesus here. Push him. Hey, Jesus, they're out of wine. Why are you telling me? And I love how it starts here, that he uses the word woman. Now, in, in this culture, there's two ways you would use that term. One would be very blunt, like, woman, what are you doing? Almost derogatory. I think Mary grounds Jesus at this point if he says this. So I don't think that's what he means. The other option is woman, almost like, mom, why are you telling me? It's kind of a soft, respectful term. Why are you telling me? And then Mary makes this statement of faith. Remember, no miracles have been done yet. This is the first time that Jesus is about to do something supernatural. And Mary's response to the the servants is, do whatever he tells you to do. Hey, how about I learn something from that? Jack, do whatever he tells you to do. I think we could all write that on a sticky note and put it on our mirror or on our steering wheel or on our fridge. Do whatever he tells you to do. Why? Because that's when the miraculous happens. Do whatever he tells you to do. There is such a faith in Mary. There is such a level of understanding and and, and expectation and understanding the authority of who Jesus is. Once again, how gratifying and rewarding for Mary and how what an easy time to drop an I told you so on everybody who may have questioned her and her special son. This is such a weird place of trusting God through your children. Mary's heart and understanding God told me this, but this is also my kid. What a unique place to be. I wish I could go from here and say, from here on out, it's puppies and unicorns. Like everything Mary asked, Jesus just did. All prayers answered. Her life is easy. Jesus' life is easy. They hold hands and skip into the future. But it is anything but that. Unfortunately, this is the furthest thing 
from the truth. One of the other traits of Mary's life that we cannot ignore is pain. Mary's life is full of sorrow. It's full of pain. The foreshadowing of this starts early on. Jesus has been born. Mary and Joseph take him to the temple to dedicate him. While they're there dedicating him, uh, people come up and begin to prophesy over him, speak over him. In Luke chapter 2, beginning at verse 33, Simeon comes up to them. Simeon is one of the prophets in the house of God. It says the child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary. Who does he speak to? Help me out. Who does he speak to? Mary. He speaks to Mary. This isn't going to Joseph. This isn't going to any of the other family members. Eye contact with Mary. Here's what he says. This child is destined to call, cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Hey mom, this child is going to break your heart. Mary's life was not an easy one. And it wasn't hard in spite of Jesus. It was hard because of Jesus. She sees John the Baptist. She knows of his beheading. She hears the horrific statements and the threats against his, her son his entire life. And why? Because he's doing miracles and because he's helping the poor and the outcast and because he's speaking truth into a culture that doesn't want to hear it and because he's challenging the status quo with, with Scripture and what God said it's supposed to be. And every one of these things brings another enemy and another attack at her baby, at her son. She's there when they try and stone him and he barely escapes. She's there when they call him a devil. She's there when Jesus gives these teachings that as a mom, she's got to be thinking, what is he saying? Who are my mother and my brothers and my sisters? And Mary's going, I raised you. I changed your diapers. What do you mean, who is your mother? It wasn't an easy life for her. And then after everything you've been through with your child, watching what they do for others, it ends with the cross. What a painful place to be. I can't imagine her husband has already died. Your other children have denied not only you, but the oldest son. They don't believe in Jesus. They ridicule him themselves. And she's living, knowing what an angel has told her about her son. And now you have to watch as what seems like what the final chapter takes place. Now, a little note here, side note. And I don't want to stay here long, but all of us have to watch someone or something not go the way we thought it would. We had a paradigm, we had a plan, we thought we knew the way things were going to go. It can be a business, it can be finances, it can be children, it can be a marriage, it can be your own life. And you look at it and you go, God, I thought I did everything the right way. And it feels like it's ending in death. You feel like, maybe like Mary, where you're watching death. This is tough. And I don't want to pretend this morning like I can give you three steps, three step answers on how to just breeze through all the problems. We look at Mary's life and we see that life is not always perfect. Mary watches all the dreams of a normal woman, a mom, a human become a nightmare. But the story doesn't end there. There's more. Mary doesn't just have painful experiences a trait in her life. Thank God she has victory as well. She has victory as well. After the crucifixion, after days in the grave, we're going to pick up reading Luke 24, once again on the screens. Luke 24, beginning at verse 1. It says, On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. 
In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. He's risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back to the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to the other, all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. Now, quick pause right here. You don't see Mary, the mother of Jesus in here, but if this is the point at his death before his resurrection, Mary would have shifted to who's the next oldest son, which is James. So most theologians believe Mary, the mother of James, is Mary at the scene. Verse 11, it says, but they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves. He went away wondering to himself what had happened. We see that Mary again in Acts 1.14. It says they all joined together constantly in prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. There's victory in this scene. Mary is going to a tomb with spices. When you're going to a tomb, what do you usually expect to see? A dead body. She's not going in victory expecting Jesus to be raised. She's going to prepare his body for the final time. Instead, there is no body. Jesus has been resurrected. She goes to the apostles, tells them they blow her off. (sighs) Women getting all emotional with this stuff. They don't believe her. And yet we know Jesus shows up later to the others. And once again, Mary has a great moment to go, I told you so. I told you so. John, James, Mark, you got something to say to me now? But instead, where do we see Mary next? Acts 1.14, in the room praying. And now Jesus' brothers are there too. They believe there's victory in this. We see the process, and in closing, what can we take away from Mary? What's the big so what here? What would I challenge you to? And here's what I would say. Hang in there and keep your integrity. No matter how rough things get, keep your integrity. Keep your character. Stay steady in the grunt work. Now, grunt work is not a term that anybody likes. It's the dirty stuff in life. It's where you get kind of messy. You skin your knees up. You sweat a lot. Maybe you stink while you're doing it. It's not the fun stuff. And in a world that is filtered, we will take 37 Instagram photos to get the right one, and then we'll color correct it, and we'll filter it, and we'll put a cat face on it or sprinkles or something to make it look just the way we want. Grunt work doesn't look pretty. Hang in there in the grunt work. Hang in there when things get tough. Mary and all she went through never backed down, never took steps back with her integrity or character. Mary had to go through some brutal seasons, as I said, because of Jesus. But in the end, I don't think she would tell us that she would have any regrets. Hang in there. Keep your integrity. Watch your words. Watch your attitude. Watch your testimony. Keep your humility. Keep the priority in obedience and faithfulness. Especially, especially in the tough times. Life is tough. But in the end, we win. 1 John 5, 4 says, For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Faith gets us through. Hold on, keep your integrity, keep your tenacity. John 16, 33, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, count on it, but take heart, I've overcome the world. Hang in there and keep your integrity no matter how rough things get. Stay steady in the grunt work. Would you bow your heads with me, please? I hope this helps you see Mary maybe in a new light. 
Maybe some of you, with what you're going through, you say, I can relate. Marriage didn't go the way Mary thought. Losing her husband when she did. Raising children didn't go the way Mary thought. Public opinion didn't go the way Mary thought. Life can be hard. But stay steady in it. Maybe you're in that spot right now where life just seems to be hitting wall after wall after wall, not making any sense. And you just need prayer to continue to take one step at a time, one foot in front of the other in the middle of the grunt work. If that's where you are, would you just raise your hand? I want to pray for you this morning just for strength in the journey. All right, thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. The other question I want to ask is maybe you grew up in a culture and environment that knew Mary one way and Jesus one way, but didn't have the full picture. And there's a time where we make the choice, like Mary, to stand for Jesus, even when things get tough. Maybe you haven't known Christ. You haven't had that relationship with him. You haven't understood him as Lord and Savior, CEO and boss of your life. He's been a nice religious figure. But there's more. Because of his death, his burial, and his resurrection on the cross from, for our rebellion, for our sin. Scripture says we can have eternal life. It's the fulfillment of Scripture. It's the fulfillment of what the angel said to Mary. Maybe you've never taken that step of saying, I want Jesus. Would you just raise your hand up? I'd love to pray with you too. Okay, thanks. Father, I pray for those who are in the cauldron right now, in what seems like the boil, the, 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 the mess. And Lord, in the struggle, it's easy to look up and go, why? Been there and done it a lot of times myself, God, you know that. But Father, I pray in this season for those who are going through it, give them the strength to one day at a time be able to take whatever's thrown at them because it feels sometimes like every day brings something new. Every hour seems to bring something new. And Lord, help us to keep our peace and our integrity in it. Lord, when the next bit of news comes at us, help us to keep our peace, our patience, our kindness, our gentleness, our mercy, our self-control because these are the fruit of your spirit in our life. And Lord, when we feel like we can't make it one more day, like Mary, may we lean into you and live in our faithfulness, humility, and obedience. In Jesus' name we pray.